Well, we've had a nice drop of rain here recently, and the weather's warmed up a bit, so everything's growing like the clappers now. It really is a wonderful time of the year. But when I say everything, of course, I include the weeds as well. So at this time, you really have to make sure you keep on top of it. Mind you, there must be something wrong with me, because I'm a bloke who actually enjoys weeding by hand. It gives you a chance to get your nose down in amongst the plants. And of course, with the soil moist and the weeds small, they come out nice and easily too. We're in the ornamental kitchen garden here, and this has been designed so that all the weeding can be done from the paths to avoid treading on the borders. So what I've done here is to edge the path with some wooden edging, and then I've set stepping stones on top of some really gritty compost and mulched over the top of that with coarse grit. And that enables me to grow these low spreading plants at the sides of the slab so that they spread over and soften the sides. And I think it produces a very attractive effect. The plant that is really catching the eye at the moment is that phlox. It's an alpine phlox called Catahoochee, and it'll be full of those blue flowers for ages. It's available at garden centres now, so it's worth looking out for. But the thing that is really preoccupying me at the moment is making sure that the exuberance of one plant doesn't damage another. This clematis is now beginning to grow into the red current, so it needs restraining. I shall be forever tying this back, and if necessary, actually cutting it out, which certainly won't do the clematis any harm at all. But there are some plants that need even more ruthless action. A plant like this variegated mint is really quite invasive, but that shouldn't put you off because it's a good plant. And although it's getting in amongst this Veronica at the moment, it's quite easy to pull out, provided you catch it before it does too much damage. On the other hand, there's a plant in this border which has a very bad reputation, which I think is quite undeserved. Unlike its green counterparts, the variegated ground elder is not at all invasive. This one has been here for seven years, and that really is as far as it's got. The flowers are not particularly attractive, though, so I'm going to take those off to reveal a little more of the attractive foliage. And when you do, it shows at the back there a plant that really is a weed. That's our native white campion but they're such attractive flowers that I'm jolly well going to leave it in. On the other hand, the Aubretia has now finished flowering and it's beginning to get a little bit straggly. They do go like that, so immediately after flowering you need to prune it back really quite hard, just clip it over the top. It makes the plant look pretty awful, but it'll soon regrow and if you do this every year after flowering, they'll go on for years. I sowed this lawn about eight weeks ago, you may remember, and it's just had its first cut. But if you look closely, you can see that it's a mass of weeds. New lawns are often like this, but I'm not worried in the slightest, because the mower will take care of most of them. It's only those that grow so close to the ground that the mower won't touch them that will survive, and there aren't very many of those. think of as a typical English garden is actually made up of plants with their origins in all corners of the world, like the peonies from southern Europe and the gorgeous range of colours you introduced with rhododendrons, which actually originated in the Orient, and some of my favourites, the aces or Japanese maples. This is another Japanese introduction. It's got quite attractive green leaves and a lovely reddish pink tinge to the stems, and of course later on in the year there'll be some creamy white flowers. It was originally introduced into this country over 160 years ago as an ornamental shrub, and to say that it's taken off in gardens is putting it mildly. Its Latin name is Polygonum cuspidatum, but it's more commonly known as Japanese knotweed. Its very name strikes horror in the hearts of anyone who's come across this Frankenstein monster of the horticultural world. It's steadily marching all over the country, even invading the beaches of Cornwall 
and often swamping any plants which get in its way. It's so tough and invasive that it can grow right through concreted areas and walls and even through tarmac. It's recognised as a major national problem and now the local authorities are having to wage war against this menace. We recognise that this pernicious weed is a major problem. For example, some 18 months ago this site was cleared of houses and now you can see the Japanese knotweed has taken over. Whenever we discover this particular problem, we try a number of techniques of spraying and cutting to get rid of the weed. However, we recognise that it will take us several years to get rid of this problem in Oldham. It seems to turn up everywhere. It surrounded Christchurch in Oldham, where the vicar, the Reverend David Banting, has joined in the attack. When we came here, it was just a weed. We've subsequently discovered that it's got a name, Japanese knotweed, but we now have our own name for it, Red Devil. And that's because whenever it shoots above the ground, it appears first as tiny little red shoots, very easy to see in clear earth at any rate, but it shoots up, little red devils, and then the green foliage comes. But you can still see the red stem is Red Devil. Good name. Well, most, most of the garden over there looks quite good to me. It doesn't... Well, it does now. My predecessor had been able to keep that front lawn more or less clear. We've sort of mown round here. Mm. But the, well, the jungle is really here, all the shrubbery here. Yeah. Ideal for children. And all the <laughs> knotweed was in here, in this derelict land where all the sort of cuttings from yep. the shrubbery here over three years have been piled up. We had enormous bonfires to get rid of most of it. And, uh, well, we've discovered that Japanese knotweed is not just a weed, it's a... It's a pest and you've got to declare war on it. And uh, you've got to go deep to get it. Because you pull out this sort of thing here. You see you've got old root there, mm. coming there, and then all this stuff here is new shooting. And that's the stuff that really goes. It goes and goes and goes. Off apparently dead root here. Here's another piece at the yeah. back. But all the time, it just keeps going. And you only have to leave, what, half an inch of that in the ground? and it'll go again. It's going to it, actually sprout from all of those yeah, little pieces, it, I think. It seems, that the, it seems that the roots get bigger the deeper you go down. And it, it shoots with all this stuff on top, you know, which is, uh, well, it goes to incredible heights. I mean, this is a piece that, that I, I brought out last year, to give you an idea of how tall well, that that's actually good, gets. Must be a good eight, ten foot, I should say. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's one year's growth. One year's growth. Eight foot, nine foot. I mean, it's impressive stuff. But, it's formed uh, a really woody stem too, hasn't yeah. it? Which is I mean, when, to get when, rid of. When we started, I mean, I just thought I wanted to get rid of it, get rid of the rubble, so and plant up a bit of shrubs and so mm. on. But the more I looked at it, the more pernicious it is. The deeper it went. I mean, I've dug this in parts here, about three foot, even four foot deep in places, and I'm still finding it. Have you tried anything other than than digging? SBK is what I tried where I could pour it without it touching anything else like the, the, the tarmac just over the wall there on, in the car park but here I've decided that the only way I can attack it is, is, is by well warfare and this marvellous instrument, this, this mattock Digging out the underground rhizome certainly helps to control this weed but what you really need to do is to combine it with regular use of a weed killer. The most effective one seems to be glyphosate, and that's available in several different forms. If you need to apply it to a large area, the best way of doing so is as a spray. But what you must remember is that glyphosate is completely unselective, so it can potentially do a lot of damage to the other plants in the garden. So whatever you do, always follow the manufacturer's instructions really closely. And remember, for best effect, you want to put the weed killer on when the knotweed is growing very, very strongly. But however you decide to tackle this problem, you're going to have to be incredibly persistent and keep a constant lookout for the little red devils. A garden on a windswept slope in North Devon, sandwiched between Exmoor and Dartmoor, is Carol Klein's idea of paradise. Carol, what brought you down here? Well, I've always lived in the city, Manchester and London, and I've always yearned for a garden. When I got the opportunity to come and teach down here, and 
than to buy a piece of land with a cottage attached. I thought um, my dreams had come true. It didn't look quite like this when we moved in. We've done a lot of work. Um, and the more I did, the more I got interested. First of all, it was weekends and after work. And eventually, it became a full-time occupation. And I now run a small nursery, which supports the garden and does. This is my idea of paradise. I must say, Carol, I'm very impressed by the way that the colours in your border seem to blend so well together. Now, you used to teach art, so you've obviously got an eye for colour, but just what is the secret? I don't think there's any secret. I think it's a, a question of trying different plants, different colours together, and if you get it wrong, change it. What, you, you just dig it up at this time of the year? Yes, even at this time of the year, if something's in the wrong place, providing you water it well beforehand and look after it when you've moved it. Um, plants don't generally come to any harm. Oh, well, that, that is very encouraging for duffers like me, you know, because that means it's just a case of trial and error. Yes, it is. I think the thing, the thing is not to persist with things that you know aren't working together and be prepared to move things around. Yeah. Well, here you've got a superb... Uh, red and purple border. This is a wonderful plant. Yes, it's a, it's a beautiful perennial wallflower called Jacob's Jacket because of the way the colour changes in the flower. It really is lovely, isn't it? And the foliage of that semisifuga, very nice. An excellent foliage plant and very pretty plumes of flower later on too. But something to look at right, right from April through to October, November. And the one, the plant that really hits you in the eye is this really deep crimson. Yeah, this is a um, seasium. It's a, a sort of thistle, not prickly at all, but um, very easy to grow, easy to cultivate, and eventually builds up to make a nice clump. And one step further around the spectrum, and we come to this really hot red border. Yeah, I find uh, red a very difficult colour to use and I tend to cheat by putting all my reds in one place. This is the red bed. Well, it's certainly very effective. It, uh, it really catches your eye as you come round there. This little scabious is very nice. Yes, it's a lovely plant, very easy to grow. Um, now called Nortia Macedonica. Lots of flowers and it flowers continuously through till about October. And just peeping through underneath there is what looks like a stachys. Yeah, again, quite, quite an unusual plant. It's stachys coccinia. Um, it's from the Mediterranean, so uh, not reliably hardy. Um, if it's well drained, it, it should do all right almost anywhere in the country, but it's very easy from seeds or cuttings. Do you think it's worth me giving that sort of thing a try out in the Midlands? Yes, if you put it in a hot, well-drained border, I think it would probably survive. In complete contrast, there's this white border, which is a particular favourite of mine. Um, it really does brighten up this corner, doesn't it? What wonderful. Now, these white foxgloves I love, do you grow those from seed? Yes, we do. Um, foxgloves are extremely promiscuous, so you've got to be careful where the bees have been but it's quite easy to tell the difference between the purple one and the white one at the seedling stage. The white foxgloves have um, much brighter green leaves and they're much softer too. So do you keep these separate from the other ones? We try to. We can't help what the bees do, but we can select the seedlings. And you've also got a rather nice geranium there. Yeah, it's a white version of the Morning Widow geranium fayum. Um, much prettier, I think, and much more visible. And a much happier plant, really, altogether, isn't Definitely. it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, I notice you're cheating here and there, Carol, with uh, quite a few plants in pots dotted around. Yeah, well, we don't think it's cheating, but, um, for instance, there's this Lilium regale. We tend to grow these in pots because they don't really thrive in our heavy clay soil and then put them into spaces where perhaps we've uh, 
uh, been growing something else earlier on, or as in this case, just plunk them down on some of the stepping stones to continue the colour through throughout the summer. But it's not just things like lilies. I know you've got alcamilla, for instance. Yes, uh, a lot of the alcamilla in the border looks as though it's planted here, but um, we grow it in pots. Works quite well, and um, be rather lovely, I think, to see the uh, rain gathered in the leaves of the alcamilla. One of the nicest summer sights there is, I think. I notice you use a few native plants as well. Yes, we do, quite a lot. And also some varieties um, of native species which have got interesting characteristics. There's a, a lovely double form of the native red campion. It, it doesn't set any seed, in fact, but um, it likes to be divided fairly frequently. If you leave the clump for too long, the plant will eventually die. So you soon have quite a lot of plants, very easily. We've also got a very nice form of uh, our meadow cranes bill here, geranium pretense. This one's album, white form, which does come true from seed. One of the things that is very noticeable about your borders is how densely you plant them. Yeah, we try and plant things quite close together. I don't have a lot of time for weeding. And uh, we hope by good cultivation that we'll um, cut down the weed population. We'll, in this bed, for instance, we've mulched with gravel. It's a hot, dry Mediterranean bed. Uh, other places in the garden we use farmyard manure or uh, bark. And then do you weed by hand? We weed by hand, yes, but we try and leave in all uh, the self-sown seedlings. Uh, if we've got too many, we pot some of them up and perhaps transfer them to other places in the garden or put them out onto the nursery. And that can be quite interesting, can't it? Have you come across any new hybrids? Yes, we've got two very lovely plants this year. Um, one's a polymonium, a Jacob's Ladder. One of its parents is the ordinary blue Jacob's Ladder and the other is Carnium, a very pretty pink one. It's a lovely colour. What are you calling that? Blue Cottage Lilac. Um, another interesting hybrid was an Iris Ansata, which my daughter Annie has christened Ghost. I think everybody needs some contact with soil and plants and gardening generally. And I hope I'm going to be able to do it forever. <laughs> The greenhouse is looking lovely at the moment, but we're liable to have problems because the plants are growing so close together, which means that not only don't they have the space they need to grow, but they're liable to suffer from pest and disease attack. Now with pests, I'm not going to use chemical sprays, I'm going to introduce biological control instead. This is where you bring in predators or parasites to the greenhouse, which are actually going to attack the pests for you. I can already see nasty build-ups of aphids on here, but the other sorts of pests were liable to get a white fly and spider mite. But of course the first job to do is to space the plants out. Now I've finished the spacing of the plants, I can introduce the control. Now you don't have to go foraging out into the hedgerows to find it, of course, it can come through the post. And uh, little amateur packs like this would cost about three pounds, so it's not terribly expensive. And that will last more or less a season. Do be careful though, don't use a wide range of chemicals before introducing these because it can affect them. There's only one or two chemicals that are safe to use and that sort of information does come with them. Now this is the predator for aphids. It's called a Fidelites and it needs to be kept moist so it comes packed in moist material. But you don't actually get the little midge travelling through the post. It comes in its pupil form and that has to be introduced to the plant by sprinkling it onto the moist surface of the compost. It will take about eight to ten days for the little pupae to hatch out and in that time it needs to stay moist so it's best to stand the pots that you're using into sources of water but of course it can fly so once the midge comes out it flies around the greenhouse looking for aphids and when it finds them it sticks its proboscis into the aphid and sucks it dry leaving a little husk behind and this will carry on with the predator breeding throughout the season really keeping on top of the aphids and giving them almost complete control you're liable to find one or two around but I think that's pretty good 
comes to red spider mite, we use another predatory mite called Phytosulus, which is a little bit larger, redder, and of course runs faster than the spider mite, and it trundles after them, eating them and its eggs. They arrive on bean leaves, which you can cut up and spread around the plants, because of course as these little mites can't fly, it's up to you to spread them around. Controlling whitefly is even easier because all you need to do is take the lid off and sit the tube in amongst the plants on the staging. Because inside the tube, the parasitized whitefly pupae, which are going to hatch out not into whitefly, but into a little parasitic wasp called Incarsia formosa. This will fly out into the greenhouse and look for other whitefly larvae in which to inject its eggs, that way controlling it. So by introducing parasites and predators, we can get effective control in the greenhouse, though not necessarily complete eradication. But you must remember to watch for the beginnings of the signs of infestation of these pests and introduce that control as soon as you see it. Another job that needs doing is the tying in of climbers. We've grown quite a few this year and I'm going to use the struts of the greenhouse as supports. I've got two rather nice passion flower plants which have been trained round and round pieces of wire. But they're sending off stems in all directions and I thought it'd be rather nice if I train these up the inside so that their flowers will all hang down. Now you can of course use ordinary drawing pins in wood, but there are specially designed pins as well to help attach climbers. With aluminium houses it's more difficult, but there are specially designed aluminium pins which will just clip into the glazing bars with hooks on to tie into. So all I need to do is just push that into the framework and then tie the long stem into it. And they produce tendrils, so once you've given them a start in the right direction, they'll usually take off on their own. When it comes to autumn, the plant will have made quite a lot of growth. We can cut that back because it will have largely finished flowering and let more light into the greenhouse, but all summer long we'll be able to enjoy those beautiful flowers. Fuchsias will soon be in full flower and they're such good greenhouse plants. They vary from great big flamboyant doubles like hazel to dainty single flowers like Coverdale Jewel with trailing varieties like Trailblazer as well. Now they're quite easy to grow, they'll grow in almost any compost and are quite easy to strike from cuttings. David Picard of Meadowcroft Fuchsias, whereas most amateurs are very carefully cutting under a node with a sharp knife, you don't bother with all this do you? No, we take a cutting based on its length and its leaf area around about two and a half inches, two to two and a half inches, with a decent leaf area, something like that. It doesn't matter if we come nodal or internodal. That's what counts, the size of the cutting. Now that surprises me, because I would have thought, well first of all I didn't realise that internodal cuttings would root, and I'd have thought that squashing them would make them rot. No, well here is a rooted internodal cutting. As you can see it's got a good root ball and a good strong cutting. I've noticed you've got an unusual method of taking the cuttings. Yes, Anne. As you can see, I do have rather long nails. and They're much more convenient for taking cuttings. It saves a lot of messing about with knives and razor blades. And the plant will root better, or the cutting will root better, and grow away much faster. Standards are very popular, and I think lots of people are interested in growing them. How do you go about starting one that's going to get to this stage? Well, to get a standard, a little table standard like this, you start from a very strong, well-rooted cutting. Preferably a tri leaf and put it into a three and a half inch pot, put a cane in, stake it regularly, tie it regularly, take out the side shoots as you go up, leaving the top four or five side shoots, but taking out the flower. All the way. All the flowers have got to come out until it reaches the top of the cane. Take the pinch the tip out and just leave it. Well, I can see that this size of standard is going to be very useful for conservatory and greenhouse staging. But my favourite plant out of all the ones you've brought is one that's a bit like a cross between a standard and a pillar, and that's that beautiful plant of Coralina. It seems like a good year for gooseberries. In fact, it could be a little bit too good. If you've got berries crowded together like these, then you'd be well advised to just thin out a few, and these thinnings can be used for cooking now to leave the rest to swell up for eating fresh later on. Now these plants are grown as cordons with three vertical arms on each plant. 
They can be grown freestanding like this or up against a fence or a wall where they'll only take up about six inches of space. So it's a very economical way of growing gooseberries. All my potatoes have been absolutely clobbered by the frost except for these here in the Elizabethan vegetable garden. And this is interesting because I've been growing these through this clear polythene in order to bring them on a little bit earlier. Now, I was told that if you do this, the frost tends to settle on the polythene rather than on the potatoes. Now, I didn't believe it either, and I can't really see why it should happen. But there's no doubt about the facts, and you can see that these have only just been touched by the frost. Hopefully, these should be a bit earlier than the others too. Oh, let's dig them up and have a look. Oh yes, there. Not at all bad. And all grown organically, I guarantee they're going to taste delicious. One of the most important things we gardeners have got to think about in the foreseeable future is water conservation. There are hose pipe bands all over the country now and it can only get worse. Well, a tremendous amount of water comes from the roof and we ought to be using that. All you need is a water butt like this and a little plastic job like this. It's very easy to fit to the downpipe and it costs just 12 pounds. The spout directs the water into the water butt and when the butt is full, all you do is turn it up like that and the water is directed straight down into the drain and it stops your butt overflowing onto the patio. Cuddling moth produces the little maggot that you only find in apples when you come to eat them. They're awful. But they can be controlled organically with pheromone traps. Now, I've shown you these before. And the idea is that you have a little capsule which contains the female sex attractant. You put it in here onto a sticky pad and the males are attracted to that and there they stick. And of course, because you've got no males, the females don't get fertilised, so you get no eggs. You need one of these for every five trees, and that will give you 85% control. Now, the normal time to put these up is the end of May or the beginning of the June. But the good news is that because of the cold weather, the coddling moth have stayed in bed. So if you haven't put them up, there's still time to do it now. Goodbye.